Well, hello, sisterhood. It is such an honor to be here with you tonight. If we haven't met before, my name is Meredith Myers, and I'm currently the elementary director here at Harris Creek. <laughs> Thank you, my fan. Um, Typically, I start a morning by saying, good morning, Navigate, so it took everything that I had to not start it that way. Um, my husband, Chris, and I moved here to Waco and have been members here at Harris Creek for almost 14 years, and we have four amazing daughters and celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary this year. Um, our daughters are currently one in college, uh, two in high school, and one sweet surprise is a third grader. <laughs> yes, laughter is necessary in that one. Okay, I just really feel privileged to be here talking to you about studying your Bible because it really is a passion of mine. But... I did not grow up going to church. And in fact, um, the God put believers around me, but I had never experienced um, the Bible before. In fact, I need to say this up front. I haven't been to seminary. And I... I'm not really an avid reader of books. Um, and in, in school, I absolutely hated English and grammar and really kind of anything that had to do with words. So how does that girl end up here tonight? So like I said, didn't grow up going to church, but God surrounded believers um, through neighbors and families in my life. And uh, through a series of circumstances at the age of 15, while I was on vacation with one of my neighbors, I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior. And when I went home, I immediately started going to church with that family and several of my friends were also at that church. And I began to learn. I mean, all I knew at that time, I did not even know you guys, John 3.16. I barely knew who Jesus was, but I did know that he died for me. And that that hole that I felt in my heart was going to be filled by him. But I was the girl sitting there next to you in church. Like every time the pastor would tell you, turn to whatever book of the Bible it was, I was looking at you, you know, at my friends and being like, where is that in my Bible? Or um, I was convinced that the pastor was going to ask me a question during the sermon that I was going to have to answer. Like, when have you ever been to church and seen a pastor do that? Never. But I was convinced that that's what happened at church. So I was kind of scared, but I kept going. And people helped me along the way in my journey. And um, I would love to tell you that as I began to study who he was, that I was a completely changed person and that life was easy from that point forward. But that really wouldn't paint an accurate picture. You see, fast forward to the age of 25, and I was early in my marriage to Chris, and my sin had made an absolute mess of my life. And I had been walking with the Lord for 10 years and that became a pivotal point in my faith. I had to stand there and look at myself in the mirror and ask some really hard
hard questions. How does a person that's walked with the Lord for 10 years make the choices, the sinful choices that I had made? Um, Did I completely ruin my life and my marriage? Did I even trust who God was? What did God even think of me? And was forgiveness even possible? Maybe you relate to that. I can't pretend to know why you're here tonight. Maybe you've asked similar questions that I've asked. Maybe you just came to know Jesus, and so you're just beginning. Maybe you've known Jesus a long time but haven't studied your Bible, or, or maybe you just don't know where to start. Well, whether you've struggled with grief or loss or apathy, like Vanessa talked about last week, I need you to know one thing. You are welcome here. Whatever your circumstances might be, you're welcome here. So, how did I get here? (laughs) I wanna ask you a few questions. Why do you think God gave us this book? Have you ever thought about that before? Why would God give us the Bible in the first place? I've thought about that, and I, and I think one reason is because he wants us to know him. Do you know him? I mean, like, really know him. See, if, if you know of me, you might have been able to like say the things that I said before about myself. But if you know me, you know that the last six years, I've walked through a lot of hard, burying and, and caring for both of my parents. If you know of me, you might kindly bring me a cup of coffee. But if you know me, you know that I drink hot tea. And if you really know me, some of you in the back, you know that I drink Earl Grey hot tea. (laughs) If you know of me, you might call me Meredith. If you know me, you probably call me Mayor. And if you really know me, you call me M. Diddy. That's right. Don't I look like an M. Diddy? It's it's a story. I'll tell you guys later. Well, maybe not tonight. But anyways, it's a story. So... Do you know him? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 says that our faith was never meant to rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So we were never meant to just know about him or know of him. We were meant to be in a relationship with him. And it's funny because yesterday we were doing a run through and I had all this scripture that I was gonna read you right now. And they looked at me and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That is way too much Bible. And I was like, y'all, this is like a Bible study methods thing. So what are you even talking about? Too much Bible? That was rude. Anyways. So for your benefit, I'll pick out one that really means a lot to me lately. And it's Psalm 23, 4. Specifically, it says, even though we walk through the darkest valley, or some translations say the valley of the shadow of death, he is 
with us. And the reason that verse means so much to me is because six years ago when my mom was diagnosed with cancer, we knew immediately it was stage four and there were only going to be a few months with her. Actually, we didn't know exactly how long, but it turned out to be two months. And during that time, as you can imagine, conversations got serious quick. And um, my mom and I would talk about a lot of things. It was really actually a sweet time. And we talked frequently about Psalm 23. It just meant a lot to her in that season. And specifically, as you might imagine, verse 4. That even though you walk through the darkest valley, he is with you. She really felt that. So fast forward, we're in the hospital. And um, it becomes clear that we're nearing the end of her life. And she makes the decision that even though her body is failing, her mind is still there. And she makes the decision to move to inpatient hospice. She wanted to do that inpatient. And so that day, I cannot even tell you, it was one of the most, I'm going to get choked up. <laughs> it was one of the most excruciating days of my life for me and for her. Because we knew we only had a few days left. So I, after that decision, I opened up a devotional that I'd given her that we had been going through together. And guess what verse was the verse on the devotional for that day? It was Psalm 23, 4. That even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. You guys, that is the kind of God that I know. That is how I know him. The Bible says a lot. There's a lot of verses in there about him. But he wants you to know him. So how are we going to do this? Tonight, I want it to be practical. So the first thing we're going to learn about is we're going to pray. The second thing we want to do is plan, develop a plan. The third thing we would like to do is practice or learn how to read the Bible with a purpose. And the last thing is we're going to involve people in that process. So first, pray. Because really, you guys, studying scripture is a work of the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean to sound all spiritual, but it is. Well, I mean, it is church. Maybe I should sound spiritual. Okay, so God gave us the Holy Spirit. When we receive Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us. 1 Corinthians 2.13 says the Spirit helps us understand spiritual realities. So we pray, asking God to open our eyes through the Spirit to the spiritual realities on the page. And I know that the Bible can be difficult to understand. It, it isn't written like a novel or a book. It has poetry in it and letters and there's like these historical reference that, I mean, I don't know, unless you've been a shepherd, which I have not, or unless you have farmed before or, I don't know, trained for something or run a marathon or whatever, there are all kinds of references that you may not get. But... The Spirit wants to help you understand what you're going to read. And it's simple. It's really just a prayer that says, Lord, open my eyes to what I'm about to read. Lead me to what is the truth that I need to see here on this page. And you guys, he does it. In the book of Matthew, it opens up with like, a list, like a genealogy of 
you know, whatever, where Jesus has come from. And I always was like, okay, next chapter, skipped over it. It never made any sense to me why it was there until one day I asked, why is it there? <laughs> Lord, tell me why it's there. And then I realized those people aren't just names. They're stories. And the more you look at the stories behind those names, the more you begin to understand who is actually part of Jesus' line. And it's encouraging, by the way, if you don't know. So it's really simple, you guys. Open with prayer. And the second thing we want to do, so first we're going to pray. The second thing we want to do is plan. We want to, like, think ahead. So when I was in college and I was a Bible study leader, there was a college pastor's wife that was there at our leader meetings. And she was amazing. She could, like, whip through the Bible and knew exactly where to go and just spouted scripture constantly. And I just sat there and thought, wow. She was 10 years older than me, and I thought, I want to be just like her in 10 years. Well, I don't think that I was. But maybe you can relate to that. Is there somebody that you know in church or in your life that you go, I want to be like her someday, spiritually speaking? Or I don't know, maybe personally speaking too, but spiritually speaking. Or sometimes the voice in your head is, I will never be able to be like her someday. And you guys, that is a lie. Don't believe that. He wants you to know him and he will help you get there. So what are we going to do when we think ahead? And JP has talked about this before. We want a time, a place, and some sort of a plan. So the time is obvious. It's when. And I don't know when that time is for you. But like for me right now, in this season of life, studying scripture first thing in the morning is what works out best for me. When I had little bitty kids, um, not so much because they were waking up at the crack of dawn or they kept me up all night. And so studying the Bible in the morning was not a good option and I did it during nap time. Or maybe right before bed works out for you. Or maybe you listen to the Bible in the car on your commute to work. Or maybe you leave the Bible open throughout the day and refer back to that scripture throughout the day. Whatever works for you is great. Just find a time that works and go with it. A place, okay, where maybe not your bed because I don't know about you, but if if I sit in my bed, then I just immediately re relax and I'm, I'm out. So maybe your bed isn't the best place. I'm not judging you if the bed is the best place for you to read your Bible. That's fine. But if not, find a chair in your apartment or your dorm or whatever um, on your back porch. Find a place that is consistent because here's the thing, you guys. When you walk past that place, it's like that mental reminder to you of that place you meet with God. And that mental reminder is important to being consistent. And the last thing is a plan. And so that's like a what. Find something that you can consistently do. And personally, if I don't have a plan, it really keeps me from being consistent. So currently, at Harris Creek, we have something called the Bible Reading Plan. And you can access it at BibleReadingPlan.org. 
And every day you get, you read a chapter, well, almost every day. We have one day off. But every day we'll go through um, some book of the Bible. Right now we're doing Hebrews. You'll read one chapter a day. And then you'll have a little section that says going deeper, which does exactly that, just gives you a little bit of deeper information. And then it'll have a few questions at the end for you to think about and pray about and apply. So it is an excellent resource at your fingertips. But you don't have to do the Bible reading plan. There are lots of great resources out there. Choose something and do it because that, I think, will help you to be consistently sitting with him and getting to know him better and his word. So first we're going to, thank you, sorry, I, it, I need feedback right now. Secondly, we're going to put together a plan. Third, we're going to practice. And you guys, this really means like when we read the word, we're going to read it with a purpose. So when I um, was 30, I learned a method of studying scripture. And I love um, what Proverbs chapter 2 verse 4 talks about. But in Proverbs chapter 2, it's talking about like studying the Bible. And verse 4 specifically says, search for it. And it's talking about searching for understanding. Search for it as for hidden treasure. And I love that. So when I was 30, I was taught this method that taught me kind of how to really search the scripture for understanding. And it's a method that I, now JP talks about it. I mean, it's widely talked about. And the idea is um, three things. First, you observe. Secondly, you interpret. Third, you're going to apply. So briefly, let me explain it to you. So observe means what do you see? Like what are the facts of the scripture? What is the subject? What is the verb? What is verb tense, the verb tense. Like, I don't even know who I am saying these things out loud. Remember how much I hate grammar and English? But now I get really excited about a verb tense. So I don't know what has happened. Um, look for repeated words in scripture. Look for connecting words like and or but or so that or Therefore, so you're looking for these types of things when you're just looking at the scripture that you're studying. So the facts. Secondly, interpret. What does it mean? And this is important because it's not what you think it means. It's what you think the author means. And there's a distinction there because you need to understand that the Bible was written, well, there were 40 different authors throughout the Bible, but they were looking at several things as they were writing it in that time. So you have to consider the context that that scripture was written within. What, what else does it say in the chapter? What does it say in the book? Who wrote it? Who's the audience? Um, you have to look at the historical references there in order to understand what the author means. You might have to look up key words. Sometimes it helps to look in different translations. There's lots of resources out there today for you to use to help you understand what the author meant. In that, er in that particular section of scripture. And then the last thing we're gonna do is apply. How does it work? You're gonna apply the passage because you guys, 
what is the point of studying his word if we don't actually put it into practice in our lives, if it doesn't actually change us? So I think that's pretty obvious, but for instance, it might be, you know, how did this passage make me think of God differently? How did I come to know him differently because of what I just read? So we're going to practice this together real quick. And we're going to use John 11.35, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. I can't really take credit for this idea. It was Vanessa, but I was like, oh, that's good. That's good. I'm using that. Okay. So first, we're going to observe the two-word passage. Who is the subject of this verse? Jesus. What did he do? What's the verb here? He wept. And I had to kind of laugh about this a little bit because as a female, you know the difference. He didn't just tear up. He wept. And I just pictured Jesus weeping. But anyways, I digress. Okay, so... You might say, great, but why? Why is he weeping? And for that, you have to look to the scripture around it to really understand what's going on in that passage. He's weeping because his friends are weeping, because they lost their brother Lazarus, and, and they think there's no hope. And so he comes, and what they think is too late, but he comes and he sees his friends weeping, and he weeps with them. So what does that tell you about Jesus? Interpret. Let's interpret. What does that tell you about Jesus? He cares. He has emotion. He feels what we feel. He has the ability to weep with you. Um, that just warmed my heart when I read that for the first time. Last, apply. How can we apply this passage? Maybe this changed your impression of who Jesus is. That's a great application. Or maybe you're somebody who doesn't know what to do when your friends are weeping. <laughs> and you just kind of awkwardly kind of I'll just sit over here while you cry. But maybe you can take a lesson from Jesus. And I'm not saying like pretend to weep, but you know, mourn with those who mourn. That has certainly meant a lot to me in the last six years. So you guys, it's that easy. But it does take practice. This is actually a seminary course that people can do. But it is that simple. And it really transformed the way I read scripture. It kept me interested. It helped me really think through what I was reading. So with our practice, we're going to observe, interpret, and apply. Okay, so first we pray. Second, we have a plan. Third, we're going to practice. And fourth, we're going to involve people. Because you guys, we were never meant to do this journey of faith alone. We're studying Hebrews right now in the Bible reading plan. And last week, we saw in Hebrews 3 verse 13 that we're to encourage one another daily. And this week, I think we'll get to it, in Hebrews 10, 24, we're supposed to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And let me tell you, it does not matter who it is. When I lived in College Station, I met a woman named Jane. And Jane, when I met her, was probably in her late 50s or early 60s. But when she was a graduate student at Duke University, 
she had been brutally attacked. And that attack left her disabled. And we were all put in this random Bible study group together, and I didn't know her at all. But she spoke of forgiveness of her attacker and a love of God that none of us had experienced the way she had. And I'm telling you guys, from that point forward, a group of us made sure we were always in Jane's group for the next few years. And she was incredible to study alongside. Her faith was just infectious. And so, you guys, it doesn't matter who. Just have people who have the same goal, that want to know him better. Maybe your life group is going to choose to study something together. That would be fantastic. Or you're just going to get a couple friends that are going to hold you accountable. You're going to hold each other accountable to studying God's word. And um, that helps a lot. Maybe they'll text you and say, did you spend time with the Lord today? And that keeps you consistent. Maybe you could teach someone what you read that morning. Teaching, I find, really helps you know the information better. And it really motivates you to really know it. So teaching can be good. Look for an opportunity to do that. And lastly, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, it's known as the Great Commission. And we are to go and make disciples and teach people to obey his commands. You guys, we were never meant to read this for ourselves and keep it. We were meant to go and to share who Jesus really is with those of us in our lives and around us. So do you know him? Do you really know him? In closing, again, we're going to pray. We're going to plan. We're going to practice. And we're going to involve people. You were never meant to just know Jesus as your rescuer and stop there. That is supposed to be the beginning of a lifelong journey, a lifelong relationship with him. So I told you before that I had to look in the mirror and ask some really hard questions. And so I began to open my Bible then and when I did, I realized there were people in there that looked exactly like me. That was so encouraging to me. I would take a word like forgiveness and I would open up to the back of my scripture and just kind of go, okay, here are all the verses that talk about forgiveness. And I would just go and look and see what it said. And when I did that, I discovered that yes, there is forgiveness. And yes, he can recreate your life and heal it and mend it and make it new and make you new. And it is a process and it takes time, but it's worth it and he will do it. I discovered yes, I can trust him, even in hard, hard times. He is who he says he is in his word. And he uses flawed and imperfect people to talk about him with the world around us. And that was such an encouragement to me. So... I just want to say that my prayer for you is from Ephesians 1, 7. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation 
so that you may know him better. Let me pray for us. God, I'm just so grateful for the women in this room. What an honor and privilege it is to speak of you and to speak about you with them. But God, I just pray that you would draw all our hearts near to you, that they would walk away and begin to implement something that they heard tonight. God, that it would transform their relationship with you, that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them and you long to be in a relationship with them. God, thank you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.